History of Portugal, Wikipedia Audio The history of Portugal can be traced from circa 400,000 years ago, when the region of present-day Portugal was inhabited by Homo heidelbergensis. The oldest human fossil is the skull discovered in the cave of Aroeira in Amunda. Later Neanderthals roamed the northern Iberian Peninsula. Homo sapiens sapiens arrived in Portugal around 35,000 years ago. Pre-Celtic tribes such as the Sinites lived in the Algarve and lower Alentejo regions before the 6th century BCE, developed the city of Tartessos and the written Tartessian language, and left many stele in the south of the country. Early in the 1st millennium BC, waves of Celts from Central Europe invaded and intermarried with the local populations to form several ethnic groups and many tribes. Their presence is traceable, in broad outline, through archaeological and linguistic evidence. Although they dominated much of the northern and central area, they were unable to establish in the south, which retained its non-Indo-European character until the Roman conquest. Some small, semi-permanent coastal settlements were founded by Phoenician Carthaginians on the southern coast. The Roman invasion in the 3rd century BC lasted several centuries, and developed the Roman provinces of Lusitania in the south and Galatia in the north. Numerous Roman sites include works of engineering, baths, temples, bridges, roads, circuses, theatres, layman's homes, coins, sarcophagi and ceramics. Etymology as elsewhere in Western Europe, there was a sharp decline in urban life during the Dark Ages following the fall of Rome. Germanic tribes controlled the territory between the 5th and 7th centuries. These included the Kingdom of the Swiba centered at Braga and the Visigothic Kingdom in the south. Under the Visigoths a new class emerged, a nobility which played a tremendous social and political role during the Middle Ages. The Church also began to play a very important part within the state, but since the Visigoths did not know Latin the Catholic bishops continued the Roman system of governance. The clergy started to emerge as a high-ranking class. In 711 an invasion by the Umayyad Caliphate, comprising Berbers from North Africa and Arabs from the Middle East, conquered the Visigoth Kingdom and founded the Muslim state of Al-Andalus. The Umayyads reigned supreme and advanced through Iberia and France until the Battle of Tours but endured across Iberia until the fall of the Kingdom of Granada in 1492. But Lisbon, Garb Al-Andalus and the rest of what would become Portugal, rebelled and freed themselves by the early 12th century. At the end of the 9th century, a small minor county based in the area of Porchescale was established under King Alfonso III of Asturias, and by the 10th century the counts were known as the Magnus Dux Portocalensium. The Kingdom of Asturias was later divided so that northern Portugal became part of the Kingdom of Leon. As a vassal of the Kingdom of Leon, Portugal grew in power and territory and occasionally gained de facto independence during weak Leon's reigns. In 1071 Garcia II of Galicia was declared King of Portugal and in 1095, Portugal broke away from the Kingdom of Galicia. At the end of the 11th century, the Burgundian knight Henry became Count of Portugal and defended its independence by merging the county of Portugal and the county of Coimbra. Henry's son Afonso Henriques proclaimed himself Prince of Portugal on June 24, 1128 and King of Portugal in 1139. In 1179 a papal bull officially recognized Afonso I as King. The Algarve was conquered from the Moors in 1249, 
and in 1255 Lisbon became the capital. Portugal's land boundaries have remained almost unchanged since the 13th century. The Treaty of Windsor created an alliance between Portugal and England that remains in effect to this day. From the late Middle Ages, in the 15th and 16th centuries, Portugal ascended to the status of a world power during Europe's Age of Discovery as it built up a vast empire, including possessions in South America, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Over the following two centuries, Portugal kept most of its colonies, but gradually lost much of its wealth and status as the Dutch, English, and French took an increasing share of the spice and slave trades by surrounding or conquering the widely scattered Portuguese trading posts and territories. Signs of military decline began with two disastrous battles, the Battle of Alcacer Quibir in Morocco in 1578 and Spain's abortive attempt to conquer England in 1588 by means of the Spanish Armada Portugal was then in a dynastic union with Spain and contributed ships to the Spanish invasion fleet. The country was further weakened by the destruction of much of its capital city in an earthquake in 1755 occupation during the Napoleonic Wars and the loss of its largest colony, Brazil, in 1822. From the middle of the 19th century to the late 1950s, nearly two million Portuguese left Portugal to live in Brazil and the United States. Early History In 1910, there was a revolution that deposed the monarchy. Amid corruption, repression of the church, and the near bankruptcy of the state, a military coup in 1926 installed a dictatorship that remained until another coup in 1974. The new government instituted sweeping democratic reforms and granted independence to all of Portugal's African colonies in 1975. Portugal is a founding member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the European Free Trade Association. It entered the European Economic Community in 1986. The word Portugal derives from the Roman, Celtic place name Porches Cale. Kale or Kale Lea was the name of a Celtic deity and also the name of an early settlement located at the mouth of the Douro River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean in the north of what is now Portugal. Around 200 BC, the Romans took the Iberian Peninsula from the Carthaginians during the Second Punic War, and in the process conquered Kale and renamed it Porches Kale. During the Middle Ages, the region around Porches Kale became known by the Swabi and Visigoths as Portocal. The name Portocal evolved into Portugal during the 7th and 8th centuries, and by the 9th century, that term was used extensively to refer to the region between the rivers Douro and Minho, the Minho flowing along what would become the northern Portugal-Spain border. By the 11th and 12th centuries, Portugal was already referred to as Portugal. The precise etymology of the name Kale is somewhat mysterious, although the most plausible origin points to Kale being a Celtic name, like many others found in the region. Indeed, the word Kale or Kala meant port, an inlet or harbour, and implied the existence of an older Celtic harbour. Furthermore, Today's Gaelic word for harbour is indeed Kala. Some argue it is the stem of Galatia, again of Celtic derivation. Another theory claims it derives from the word Caladunum. In any case, the particle Portu in the word Portocal was used as the basis of Porto, the modern name for the city located on the site of the ancient city of Kale at the mouth of the Douro River and port became the English name of the wine actually produced further inland, in the upper Douro Valley region, 
but exported through Porto. The name Kale is today reflected in Gaia, a city on the left bank of the river. The region of present-day Portugal has been inhabited by humans since circa 400,000 years ago, when Homo heidelbergensis entered the area. The oldest human fossil found in Portugal is the 400,000-year-old Aroeira 3H heidelbergensis skull discovered in the cave of Aroeira in 2014. Later Neanderthals roamed the northern Iberian Peninsula and a tooth has been found at Nova de Columbeira Cave in Estremadura. Homo sapiens sapiens arrived in Portugal around 35,000 years ago and spread rapidly throughout the country. Prehistory Ancient History Pre-Celtic tribes inhabited Portugal leaving a remarkable cultural footprint. The Sinides developed a written language, leaving many stele, which are mainly found in the south of Portugal. Romanization Germanic invasions Al-Andalus Reconquista Creation of the County of Portugal Early in the first millennium BC, Several waves of Celts invaded Portugal from Central Europe and intermarried with the local populations to form several different ethnic groups, with many tribes. The Celtic presence in Portugal is traceable, in broad outline, through archaeological and linguistic evidence. They dominated much of northern and central Portugal, but in the south they were unable to establish their stronghold which retained its non-Indo-European character until the Roman conquest. In southern Portugal, some small, semi-permanent commercial coastal settlements were also founded by Phoenician Carthaginians. Archaeological artifact from the work developed in the area of Satania de Brightiaros. Cross or Cruzado in Satania de Brightiaros. Foundation of the Kingdom of Portugal Informative plaque of the Proto-Historic Settlement of Satania de Brightiaros Another artifact from Satania de Brightiaros A Pedra Formosa Numerous pre-Roman peoples of the Iberian Peninsula inhabited the territory when a Roman invasion occurred in the 3rd century BC. The Romanization of Hispania took several centuries. The Roman provinces that covered present-day Portugal were Lusitania in the south and Galatia in the north. Numerous Roman sites are scattered around present-day Portugal. Some of the urban remains are quite large, such as Conambriga and Merobrigia. Several works of engineering such as baths, temples, bridges, roads, circuses, theatres, and layman's homes are preserved throughout the country. Coins, sarcophagi, and ceramics are also numerous. Following the fall of Rome, the Kingdom of the Swibi and the Visigothic Kingdom controlled the territory between the 5th and 7th centuries. Romanization began with the arrival of the Roman army in the Iberian Peninsula in 218 BC during the Second Punic War against Carthage. The Romans sought to conquer Lusitania, a territory that included all of modern Portugal south of the Douro River and Spanish Estremadura, with its capital at Emerita Augusta. Affirmation of Portugal Mining was the primary factor that made the Romans interested in conquering the region, one of Rome's strategic objectives was to cut off Carthaginian access to the Iberian copper, tin, gold, and silver mines. The Romans intensely exploited the Algestral and Santo Domingo mines in the Iberian Pyrite Belt which extends to Seville. While the south of what is now Portugal was relatively easily occupied by the Romans, the conquest of the north was achieved only with difficulty due to resistance from Serida Estrella by Celts and Lusitanians led by Viriatus, who managed to resist Roman expansion for years. 
Viriatus, a shepherd from Sarada Estrella who was expert in guerrilla tactics, waged relentless war against the Romans, defeating several successive Roman generals, until he was assassinated in 140 BC by traitors bought by the Romans. Viriatus has long been hailed as the first truly heroic figure in Proto-Portuguese history. Nonetheless, he was responsible for raids into the more settled Romanized parts of southern Portugal and Lusitania that involved the victimization of the inhabitants. Naval Exploration and Portuguese Empire The conquest of the Iberian Peninsula was complete two centuries after the Roman arrival, when they defeated the remaining Cantabri, Astures and Galaci in the Cantabrian Wars in the time of Emperor Augustus. In 74 AD, Vespasian granted Latin rights to most municipalities of Lusitania. In 212 AD, the Constitutio Antonin Iana gave Roman citizenship to all free subjects of the empire and, at the end of the century, the Emperor Diocletian founded the province of Galatia, which included modern-day northern Portugal, with its capital at Bracara Augusta. As well as mining, the Romans also developed agriculture, on some of the best agricultural land in the empire. In what is now Alentejo, vines and cereals were cultivated, and fishing was intensively pursued in the coastal belt of the Algarve, Pavo de Varzim, Matosinhas, Troia, and the coast of Lisbon, for the manufacture of garum that was exported by Roman trade routes to the entire empire. Business transactions were facilitated by coinage and the construction of an extensive road network, bridges, and aqueducts, such as Trajan's Bridge in Aqui Flavii. Discovery of the Sea Route to India and the Treaty of Tordesillas Portuguese Empire 1580 Succession Crisis, Iberian Union and Decline of the Empire Roman rule brought geographical mobility to the inhabitants of Portugal and increased their interaction with the rest of the world as well as internally. Soldiers often served in different regions and eventually settled far from their birthplace, while the development of mining attracted migration into the mining areas. The Romans founded numerous cities, such as Olizippo, Bracara Augusta, Emium, and Pax Julia, and left important cultural legacies in what is now Portugal. Vulgar Latin became the dominant language of the region and Christianity spread throughout Lusitania from the 3rd century. In 409, with the decline of the Roman Empire, the Iberian Peninsula was occupied by Germanic tribes that the Romans referred to as barbarians. In 411, with the federation contract with Emperor Honorius, many of these people settled in Hispania. An important group was made up of the Swibi and Vandals in Galatia, who founded a Swibi kingdom with its capital in Braga. They came to dominate Emium as well, and there were Visigoths to the south. The Swibi and the Visigoths were the Germanic tribes who had the most lasting presence in the territories corresponding to modern Portugal. As elsewhere in Western Europe, there was a sharp decline in urban life during the Dark Ages. Roman institutions disappeared in the wake of the Germanic invasions with the exception of ecclesiastical organizations, which were fostered by the Swibi in the 5th century and adopted by the Visigoths afterwards. Although the Swibi and Visigoths were initially followers of Arianism and Prechilianism, they adopted Catholicism from the local inhabitants. St. Martin of Braga was a particularly influential evangelist at this time. In 429, the Visigoths moved south to expel the Alans and Vandals and founded a kingdom with its capital in Toledo. From 470, conflict between the Swibi and Visigoths increased. 
In 585, the Visigothic king Liovigild conquered Braga and annexed Galatia. From that time, the Iberian Peninsula was unified under a Visigothic kingdom. With the Visigoths settled in the newly formed kingdom, a new class emerged that had been unknown in Roman times, a nobility, which played a tremendous social and political role during the Middle Ages. It was also under the Visigoths that the Church began to play a very important part within the state. Since the Visigoths did not learn Latin from the local people, they had to rely on Catholic bishops to continue the Roman system of governance. The laws established during the Visigothic monarchy were thus made by councils of bishops, and the clergy started to emerge as a high-ranking class. During the Caliphate of the Umayyad Caliph al-Walid I, the Berber commander Tariq ibn Ziyad led a small force that landed at Gibraltar on April 30, 711, ostensibly to intervene in a Visigothic civil war. After a decisive victory over King Roderick at the Battle of Guadalete on July 19, 711, Tariq ibn Ziyad, joined by the Arab governor Musa ibn Nasser of Afriqiya, brought most of the Visigothic kingdom under Muslim occupation in a seven-year campaign. The Visigothic resistance to this invasion was ineffective, though sieges were required to sack a couple of cities. This is in part because the ruling Visigoth population is estimated at a mere 1-2% of the total population. On one hand this isolation is said to have been a reasonably strong and effective instrument of government, on the other, it was highly centralized to the extent that the defeat of the royal army left the entire land open to the invaders. The resulting power vacuum which may have indeed caught Tariq completely by surprise, would have aided the Muslim conquest immensely. Indeed, it may have been equally welcome to the Hispano-Roman peasants who as D.W. Lomax claims were disillusioned by the prominent legal, linguistic and social divide between them and the barbaric and decadent Visigoth royal family. The Visigothic territories included what is today Spain, Portugal, Andorra, Gibraltar, and the southwestern part of France known in ancient times as Septimania. The invading Moors wanted to conquer and convert all of Europe to Islam, so they crossed the Pyrenees to use Visigothic Septimania as a base of operations. Muslims called their conquests in Iberia al-Andalus and in what was to become Portugal, they mainly consisted of the old Roman province of Lusitania, while Galatia remained unsubdued. Until the Berber revolt in the 730s, al-Andalus was treated as a dependency of Umayyad North Africa. Subsequently, links were strained until the caliphate was overthrown in the late 740s. The invading medieval Muslim Moors, who conquered and destroyed the Christian Visigothic kingdom in the Iberian Peninsula, were mainly Berbers from North Africa, but they were joined by Arabs from the Middle East. By 714 Evora, Santarum and Coimbra had been conquered, and two years later Lisbon was in Muslim control. By 718 most of today's Portuguese territory was under Umayyad rule. The Umayyads eventually stopped in Poitiers but Muslim rule in Iberia would last until 1492 with the fall of the Kingdom of Granada. For the next several centuries, much of the Iberian Peninsula remained under Umayyad rule. Much of the populace was allowed to remain Christian, and many of the lesser feudal rulers worked out deals where they would submit to Umayyad rule in order to remain in power. They would pay a jizya tax, kill or turn over rebels, and in return receive support from the central government. But some regions, including Lisbon, Garb al-Andalus, and the rest of what would become Portugal, rebelled succeeded in freeing themselves by the early 10th century. 
In 718 AD, a Visigothic noble named Pelagius was elected leader by many of the ousted Visigoth nobles. Pelagius called for the remnant of the Christian Visigothic armies to rebel against the Moors and regroup in the unconquered northern Asturian highlands, better known today as the Cantabrian Mountains, a small mountain region in modern northwestern Spain adjacent to the Bay of Biscay. He planned to use the Cantabrian mountain range as a place of refuge and protection from the invaders and as a springboard to reconquer lands from the Moors. After defeating the Moors in the Battle of Covadonga in 722 AD, Pelagius was proclaimed king to found the Christian Kingdom of Asturias and start the War of Reconquest known in Portuguese as the Reconquista. Currently, historians and archaeologists generally agree that northern Portugal between the Minho and the Douro rivers kept a significant share of its population a social and political Christian area that until the late 9th century had no acting state powers. However, in the late 9th century, the region became part of a complex of powers, the Galician, Asturian, Leones and Portuguese power structures. At the end of the 9th century, a small minor county based in the area of Porchescale was established by Vimara Paris on the orders of King Alfonso III of Leon, Galicia, and Asturias. After annexing the county of Portugal into one of the several counties that made up its realms, King Alfonso III named Vimara Paris as its first count. Since the rule of Count Diogo Fernandes, the county increased in size and importance and, from the 10th century onward, with Count Goncalo Mendes as Magnus Dux Porto Calencium, the Portuguese counts started using the title of Duke, indicating even larger importance and territory. The region became known simultaneously as Porto Cal, Portugal, and Portugalia the County of Portugal. The Kingdom of Asturias was later divided as a result of dynastic disputes, the northern region of Portugal became part of the Kingdom of Galicia and later part of the Kingdom of Leon. Swibavisigothic arts and architecture, in particular sculpture, had shown a natural continuity with the Roman period. With the Reconquista, new artistic trends took hold with Galician Asturian influences more visible than the Leones. The Portuguese group was characterized by a general return to classicism. The county courts of Visu and Coimbra played a very important role in this process. Mozarabic architecture was found in the south, in Lisbon, and beyond while in the Christian realms Galician Portuguese and Asturian architecture prevailed. As a vassal of the Kingdom of Leon, Portugal grew in power and territory and occasionally gained de facto independence during weak Leon's reigns, Count Mendo Goncalves even became regent of the Kingdom of Leon between 999 and 1008. In 1070, the Portuguese Count Nuno Mendes desired the Portuguese title and fought the Battle of Pedroso on February 18, 1071 with Garcia II of Galicia, who gained the Galician title, which included Portugal, after the 1065 partition of the Leones realms. The battle resulted in Nuno Mendes' death and the declaration of Garcia as King of Portugal the first person to claim this title. Garcia started to styled himself as King of Portugal and Galicia. Garcia's brothers, Sancho II of Castile and Alfonso VI of Leon, united and annexed Garcia's kingdom in 1071 as well. They agreed to split it among themselves, however, Sancho was killed by a noble the next year. Alfonso took Castile for himself and Garcia recovered his kingdom of Portugal and Galicia. In 1073, Alfonso VI gathered all power, and beginning in 1077, 
styled himself Imperator Todius Hispanii. When the emperor died, the crown was left to his daughter Euraca, while his illegitimate daughter Teresa inherited the county of Portugal. In 1095, Portugal broke away from the Kingdom of Galicia. Its territories, consisting largely of mountains, moorland, and forests, were bounded on the north by the Minho River, and on the south by the Mondego River. At the end of the 11th century, the Burgundian knight Henry became Count of Portugal and defended its independence by merging the County of Portugal and the County of Coimbra. His efforts were assisted by a civil war that raged between Leon and Castile and distracted his enemies. Henry's son Afonso Henriques took control of the county upon his death. The city of Braga, the unofficial Catholic center of the Iberian Peninsula, faced new competition from other regions. Lords of the cities of Coimbra and Porto fought with Braga's clergy and demanded the independence of the reconstituted county. Portugal traces its national origin to June 24, 1128, the date of the Battle of São Mamede. Afonso proclaimed himself Prince of Portugal after this battle and in 1139, he assumed the title King of Portugal. In 1143, the Kingdom of Leon recognized him as King of Portugal by the Treaty of Zamora. In 1179, the Papal Bull Manifestus Probatum of Pope Alexander III officially recognized Afonso I as King. After the Battle of São Mamede, the first capital of Portugal was Guimarães, from which the first king ruled. Later, when Portugal was already officially independent, he ruled from Coimbra. The Algarve, the southernmost region of Portugal, was finally conquered from the Moors in 1249, and in 1255 the capital shifted to Lisbon. Neighboring Spain would not complete its reconquista until 1492, almost 250 years later. Portugal's land boundaries have been notably stable for the rest of the country's history. The border with Spain has remained almost unchanged since the 13th century. The Treaty of Windsor created an alliance between Portugal and England that remains in effect to this day. Since early times, fishing and overseas commerce have been the main economic activities. During the 15th and 16th centuries, Portugal became a leading European power that ranked with England, France and Spain in terms of economic, political and cultural influence. Though not dominant in European affairs, Portugal did have an extensive colonial trading empire throughout the world backed by a powerful thalassocracy. The beginnings of the Portuguese Empire can be traced to July 25, 1415, when the Portuguese Armada set sail for the rich Islamic trading center of Ceuta in North Africa. The Armada was accompanied by King John I his sons Prince Duarte, Prince Pedro, and Prince Henry the Navigator, and the legendary Portuguese hero Nuno Álvarez Pereira. On August 21, 1415, Ceuta was conquered by Portugal, and the long-lived Portuguese Empire was founded. The conquest of Ceuta was facilitated by a major civil war that had been engaging the Muslims of the Maghreb since 1411. This civil war prevented a recapture of Ceuta from the Portuguese, when the king of Granada Muhammad IX, the left-handed, laid siege to Ceuta and attempted to coordinate forces in Morocco and attract aid and assistance for the effort from Tunis. The Muslim attempt to retake Ceuta was ultimately unsuccessful and Ceuta remained the first part of the new Portuguese Empire. Further steps were taken that would soon expand the Portuguese Empire much further. 
In 1418, two of Prince Henry the Navigator as captains, Jaogon Calvez Zarco and Tristao Vaz Tixera, were driven by a storm to an island that they called Porto Santo in gratitude for their rescue from the shipwreck. In 1419, Jaogon Calvez Zarco disembarked on the island of Madeira. Uninhabited Madeira was colonized by the Portuguese in 1420. Between 1427 and 1431, most of the Azores were discovered and these uninhabited islands were colonized by the Portuguese in 1445. Portuguese expeditions may have attempted to colonize the Canary Islands as early as 1336, but the Crown of Castile objected to any Portuguese claim to them. Castile began its own conquest of the Canaries in 1402. Castile expelled the last Portuguese from the Canary Islands in 1459 and they would eventually become part of the Spanish Empire. In 1434, Gilines passed Cape Bohater, south of Morocco. The trip marked the beginning of the Portuguese exploration of Africa. Before this event, very little was known in the world about what lay beyond the Cape. At the end of the 13th century and the beginning of the 14th, those who tried to venture there became lost, which gave birth to legends of sea monsters. Some setbacks occurred, in 1436 the Canaries were officially recognized as Castilian by the Pope earlier they had been recognized as Portuguese, in 1438, the Portuguese were defeated in a military expedition to Tangier. These setbacks did not deter the Portuguese from pursuing their exploratory efforts. In 1448, on the small island of Argam off the coast of Mauritania, an important castle was built to function as a feederia, or trading post, for commerce with inland Africa. Some years before, the first African gold was brought to Portugal that circumvented the Arab caravans that crossed the Sahara. Some time later, the caravels explored the Gulf of Guinea, which led to the discovery of several uninhabited islands, Cape Verde, Fernau Poo, Sao Tome, Principe, and Anoban. On November 13, 1460, Prince Henry the Navigator died. He had been the leading patron of maritime exploration by Portugal and immediately following his death, exploration lapsed. Henry's patronage had shown that profits could be made from the trade that followed the discovery of new lands. Accordingly, when exploration commenced again, private merchants led the way in attempting to stretch trade routes further down the African coast. In the 1470s, Portuguese trading ships reached the Gold Coast. In 1471, the Portuguese captured Tangier, after years of attempts. Eleven years later, the fortress of São Jorge de Mina in the town of Elmina on the Gold Coast in the Gulf of Guinea was built. Christopher Columbus set sail aboard the fleet of ships taking materials and building crews to Elmina in December 1481. In 1483, Diogo Cao reached and explored the Congo River. In 1484, Portugal officially rejected Columbus' idea of reaching India from the west, because it was seen as unfeasible. Some historians have claimed that the Portuguese had already performed fairly accurate calculations concerning the size of the world and therefore knew that sailing west to reach the Indies would require a far longer journey than navigating to the east. However, this continues to be debated. 
Thus began a long-lasting dispute that eventually resulted in the signing of the Treaty of Tordesillas with Castile in 1494. The treaty divided the New World equally between the Portuguese and the Castilians, along a north-south meridian line 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands, with all lands to the east belonging to Portugal and all lands to the west to Castile. With the expedition beyond the Cape of Good Hope by Bartolomeu Dias in 1487, the richness of India was now accessible. Indeed, the Cape takes its name from the promise of rich trade with the East. Between 1498 and 1501, Pero de Barcelos and João Fernandes Lavrador explored North America. At the same time, Pero de Cavalhar reached Ethiopia by land. Vasco da Gama sailed for India and arrived at Calicut on May 20, 1498, returning in glory to Portugal the next year. The monastery of Geronimos was built, dedicated to the discovery of the route to India. At the end of the 15th century, Portugal expelled some local Sephardic Jews, along with those refugees who had come from Castile and Aragon after 1492. In addition, many Jews were forcibly converted to Catholicism and remained as conversos. Many Jews remained secretly Jewish, in danger of persecution by the Portuguese Inquisition. In 1506, 3,000 new Christians were massacred in Lisbon. In the spring of 1500, Pedro Álvarez Cabral set sail from Cape Verde with 13 ships and crews and nobles such as Nicolau Coelho, the explorer Bartolomeu Dias and his brother Diogo, Duarte Pacheco Pereira, nine chaplains, and some 1,200 men. From Cape Verde, they sailed southwest across the Atlantic. On April 22, 1500, they caught sight of land in the distance. They disembarked and claimed this new land for Portugal. This was the coast of what would later become the Portuguese colony of Brazil. The real goal of the expedition, however, was to open sea trade to the empires of the East. Trade with the East had effectively been cut off since the conquest of Constantinople in 1453. Accordingly, Cabral turned away from exploring the coast of the new land of Brazil and sailed southeast, back across the Atlantic and around the Cape of Good Hope. Cabral reached Sofala on the east coast of Africa in July 1500. In 1505, a Portuguese fort was established here and the land around the fort would later become the Portuguese colony of Mozambique. Cabral's fleet then sailed east and landed in Calicut in India in September 1500. Here they traded for pepper and, more significantly, opened European sea trade with the empires of the east. No longer would the Muslim Ottoman occupation of Constantinople form a barrier between Europe and the East. Ten years later, in 1510, Afonso de Albuquerque, after attempting and failing to capture and occupy Zamorin S. Calicut militarily, conquered Goa on the west coast of India. Jao de Nova discovered Ascension Island in 1501 and St. Helena, Indiana 1502, Tristao da Cuna was the first to sight the archipelago still known by his name in 1506. In 1505, Francisco de Almeida was engaged to improve Portuguese trade with the Far East. Accordingly, he sailed to East Africa. Several small Islamic states along the coast of Mozambique Kilwe, Brava, and Mombasa were destroyed or became subjects or allies of Portugal. Almeida then sailed on to Cochin, 
made peace with the ruler and built a stone fort there. Decline of the Portuguese Empire under the Philippine Dynasty By the 16th century, the two million people who lived in the original Portuguese lands ruled a vast empire with many millions of inhabitants in the Americas, Africa, the Middle East and Asia. From 1514, the Portuguese had reached China and Japan. In the Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea, one of Cabral's ships discovered Madagascar, which was partly explored by Tristao da Cunha. Mauritius was discovered in 1507, Socotra occupied in 1506, and in the same year, Lourenco de Almeida visited Ceylon. In the Red Sea, Misawa was the most northerly point frequented by the Portuguese until 1541, when a fleet under Estiveo de Gama penetrated as far as Suez. Hormuz, in the Persian Gulf, was seized by Afonso de Albuquerque in 1515, who also entered into diplomatic relations with Persia. In 1521, a force under Antonio Correa conquered Bahrain and ushered in a period of almost 80 years of Portuguese rule of the Persian Gulf archipelago. On the Asiatic mainland, the first trading stations were established by Pedro Alvarez Cabral at Cochin and Calicut. More important were the conquests of Goa and Malacca by Afonso de Albuquerque, and the acquisition of Daya by Martim Afonso de Souza. East of Malacca, Albuquerque sent Duarte Fernandez as envoy to Siam in 1511 and dispatched to the Moluccas two expeditions which founded the Portuguese dominion in maritime Southeast Asia. The Portuguese established their base in the Spice Islands on the island of Ambon. For now Pires de Andrade visited Canton in 1517 and opened up trade with China, where, in 1557, the Portuguese were permitted to occupy Macau. Japan accidentally reached by three Portuguese traders in 1542, soon attracted large numbers of merchants and missionaries. In 1522, one of the ships in the expedition that Ferdinand Magellan organized in the Spanish service completed the first circumnavigation of the globe. On August 4, 1578, while fighting in Morocco, Young King Sebastian died in the Battle of Alcacer Quibir without an heir. The late king's elderly great uncle, Cardinal Henry, then became king. Henry I died a mere two years later, on January 31, 1580. The death of the latter, without any appointed heirs, led to the Portuguese succession crisis of 1580. Portugal was worried about the maintenance of its independence and sought help to find a new king. Portuguese Restoration War One of the claimants to the throne, Antonio, prior of Croto, a bastard son of Infante Luis, Duke of Beja, and only grandson through the male line of King Manuel I of Portugal, lacked support from the clergy and most of the nobility but was acclaimed as king in Santarum and in some other towns in June 1580. Philip II of Spain, through his mother Isabella of Portugal, also a grandson of Manuel I, claimed the Portuguese throne and did not recognize Antonio as king of Portugal. The king appointed Fernando Álvarez de Toledo, 3rd Duke of Alba, as captain general of his army. The duke was 73 years old and ill at the time, but Fernando mustered his forces, estimated at 20,000 men, in Badajoz and in June 1580 crossed the Spanish-Portuguese border and moved towards Lisbon. Pombalan Era 
the Duke of Alba met little resistance and in July set up his forces at Cascais, west of Lisbon. By mid-August, the Duke was only 10 kilometers from the city. West of the small brook Alcantara, the Spanish encountered a Portuguese force on the eastern side of it, commanded by Antonio, prior of Crito, and his lieutenant Francisco de Portugal, third count of Vimioso. In late August, the Duke of Alba defeated Antonio's force, a ragtag army assembled in a hurry and composed mainly of local peasants, and freed slaves at the Battle of Alcantara. This battle ended in a decisive victory for the Spanish army, both on land and sea. Two days later, the Duke of Alba captured Lisbon, and on March 25, 1581, Philip II of Spain was crowned King of Portugal and Tomar as Philip I. This cleared the way for Philip to create an Iberian Union spanning all of Iberia under the Spanish crown. Philip rewarded the Duke of Alba with the titles of First Viceroy of Portugal on July 18, 1580 and Constable of Portugal in 1581. With these titles, the Duke of Alba represented the Spanish monarch in Portugal and was second in hierarchy only after King Philip in Portugal. He held both titles until his death in 1582. Portuguese-led invasion of Spain in 1707 The Ghost War The Portuguese and Spanish empires came under a single rule, but resistance to Spanish rule in Portugal did not come to an end. The Prior of Crito held out in the Azores until 1583, and he continued to seek to recover the throne actively until his death in 1595. Impostors claimed to be King Sebastian in 1584, 1585, 1595 and 1598. Sebastianism, the myth that the young king will return to Portugal on a foggy day, has prevailed until modern times. After the 16th century, Portugal gradually saw its wealth and influence decrease. Portugal was officially an autonomous state, but in actuality, the country was in a personal union with the Spanish crown from 1580 to 1640. The Council of Portugal remained independent inasmuch as it was one of the key administrative units of the Castilian monarchy, legally on equal terms with the Council of the Indies. The joining of the two crowns deprived Portugal of a separate foreign policy, and the enemies of Spain became the enemies of Portugal. England had been an ally of Portugal since the Treaty of Windsor in 1386, but war between Spain and England led to a deterioration of the relations with Portugal's oldest ally and the loss of Hormuz in 1622. From 1595 to 1663, the Dutch-Portuguese War led to invasions of many countries in Asia and competition for commercial interests in Japan, Africa, and South America. In 1624, the Dutch seized Salvador, the capital of Brazil. In 1630, they seized Pernambuco in northern Brazil. A treaty of 1654 returned Pernambuco to Portuguese control, however. Both the English and the Dutch continued to aspire to dominate both the Atlantic slave trade and the spice trade with the Far East. Crises of the 19th Century The First Republic Religion Constitution Political Instability Evaluation of the Republican Experiment May 28, 1926 Coup d'état Estado Novo
Salazar Dictatorship World War II Colonies The Third Republic Notes Bibliography The Dutch intrusion into Brazil was long-lasting and troublesome to Portugal. The Dutch captured the entire coast except that of Bahia and much of the interior of the contemporary northeastern Brazilian states of Bahia, Sergipe, Alagoas, Pernambuco, Paraíba, Rio Grande do Norte and Ceará, while Dutch privateers sacked Portuguese ships in both the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Beginning with a major Spanish-Portuguese military operation in 1625, this trend was reversed, and it laid the foundations for the recovery of remaining Dutch-controlled areas. The other smaller, less developed areas were recovered in stages and relieved of Dutch piracy in the next two decades by local resistance and Portuguese expeditions. After the dissolution of the Iberian Union in 1640, Portugal would re-establish its authority over some lost territories of the Portuguese Empire. At home, life was calm and serene under the first two Spanish kings, Philip II and Philip III. They maintained Portugal's status, gave excellent positions to Portuguese nobles in the Spanish courts, and Portugal maintained an independent law, currency, and government. It was even proposed to move the Spanish capital to Lisbon. Later, Philip IV tried to make Portugal a Spanish province, and Portuguese nobles lost power. Because of this, as well as the general strain on the finances of the Spanish throne as a result of the Thirty Years' War, the Duke of Braganza, one of the great native noblemen and a descendant of King Manuel I, was proclaimed King of Portugal as John IV on December 1, 1640, and a war of independence against Spain was launched. The governors of Ceuta did not accept the new king, rather, they maintained their allegiance to Philip III. Although Portugal had substantially attained its independence in 1640, the Spanish continued to try to reassert their control for the next 28 years, only recognizing the new Portuguese dynasty in 1668. In the 17th century, many Portuguese emigrated to Brazil. From 1709, John V prohibited emigration, since Portugal had lost a sizable proportion of its population. Brazil was elevated to a vice kingdom. In 1738, Sebastião de Melo, the talented son of a Lisbon squire, began a diplomatic career as the Portuguese ambassador in London and later in Vienna. The Queen Consort of Portugal, Maria Anna of Austria, was fond of Melo, and after his first wife died, she arranged the widowed de Mello's second marriage to the daughter of the Austrian Field Marshal Leopold Joseph, Count von Don. King John V of Portugal, however, was not pleased and recalled Mello to Portugal in 1749. John V died the following year, and his son Joseph I of Portugal was crowned. In contrast to his father, Joseph I was fond of de Mello, and with the Maria Anna's approval, he appointed Mello as Minister of Foreign Affairs. As the king's confidence in de Mello increased, he entrusted him with more control of the state. By 1755, Sebastião de Mello was made Prime Minister. Impressed by British economic success he had witnessed while ambassador, he successfully implemented similar economic policies in Portugal. He abolished slavery in Portugal and in the Portuguese colonies in India, reorganized the army and the navy, restructured the University of Coimbra, and ended discrimination against different Christian sects in Portugal.
but Sebastiao de Melo's greatest reforms were economic and financial, with the creation of several companies and guilds to regulate every commercial activity. He demarcated the region for production of port to ensure the wine's quality, and this was the first attempt to control wine quality and production in Europe. He ruled with a strong hand by imposing strict law on all classes of Portuguese society, from the high nobility to the poorest working class, along with a widespread review of the country's tax system. These reforms gained him enemies in the upper classes, especially among the high nobility, who despised him as a social upstart. Empire Disaster fell upon Portugal in the morning of November 1, 1755, when Lisbon was struck by a violent earthquake with an estimated Richter scale magnitude of 9. The city was razed to the ground by the earthquake and the subsequent tsunami and fires. De Mello survived by a stroke of luck and then immediately embarked on rebuilding the city, with his famous quote, What now? We bury the dead and feed the living. Despite the calamity, Lisbon suffered no epidemics and within less than one year was already being rebuilt. The new downtown of Lisbon was designed to resist subsequent earthquakes. Architectural models were built for tests, and the effects of an earthquake were simulated by marching troops around the models. The buildings and big squares of the Pombalan downtown of Lisbon still remain as one of Lisbon's tourist attractions, they represent the world's first quake-proof buildings. Sebastião de Mello also made an important contribution to the study of seismology by designing an inquiry that was sent to every parish in the country. Following the earthquake, Joseph I gave his prime minister even more power, and Sebastião de Mello became a powerful, progressive dictator. As his power grew, his enemies increased in number, and bitter disputes with the high nobility became frequent. In 1758, Joseph I was wounded in an attempted assassination. The Tavera family and the Duke of Aveiro were implicated and executed after a quick trial. The Jesuits were expelled from the country and their assets confiscated by the crown. Sebastião de Mello showed no mercy and prosecuted every person involved, even women and children. This was the final stroke that broke the power of the aristocracy and ensured the victory of the minister against his enemies. Based upon his swift resolve, Joseph I made his loyal minister Count of Urieras in 1759. Historiography Following the Tavera affair, the new Count of Urieras knew no opposition. Made Marquis of Pombal in 1770, he effectively ruled Portugal until Joseph I's death in 1779. However, Historians also argue that Pombal's enlightenment, while far-reaching, was primarily a mechanism for enhancing autocracy at the expense of individual liberty and an apparatus for crushing opposition, suppressing criticism, furthering colonial economic exploitation, intensifying book censorship and consolidating personal control and profit. The new ruler, Queen Maria I of Portugal, disliked the Marquis, and forbade him from coming within twenty miles of her, thus curtailing his influence. In 1707, as part of the War of the Spanish Succession, a joint Portuguese, Dutch, and British army, led by the Marquis of Minas, Antonio Luis de Souza, conquered Madrid and acclaimed the Archduke Charles of Austria as King Charles III of Spain. Along the route to Madrid, the army led by the Marquis of Minas was successful in conquering Ciudad Rodrigo and Salamanca. Later in the following year, Madrid was reconquered by Spanish troops loyal to the Bourbons. 
In 1762, France and Spain tried to urge Portugal to join the Bourbon family compact by claiming that Great Britain had become too powerful due to its successes in the Seven Years' War. Joseph refused to accept and protested that his 1704 alliance with Britain was no threat. In spring 1762, Spanish and French troops invaded Portugal from the north as far as the Douro, while a second column sponsored the siege of Almeida, captured the city, and threatened to advance on Lisbon. The arrival of a force of British troops helped the Portuguese army commanded by the Count of Lip by blocking the Franco-Spanish advance and driving them back across the border following the Battle of Valencia de Alcantara. At the Treaty of Paris in 1763, Spain agreed to hand Almeida back to Portugal. In 1807, Portugal refused Napoleon Bonaparte's demand to accede to the continental system of embargo against the United Kingdom, a French invasion under General Junot followed, and Lisbon was captured on December 8, 1807. British intervention in the Peninsular War helped in maintaining Portuguese independence, the last French troops were expelled in 1812. The war cost Portugal the town of Olivenxa, now governed by Spain. Rio de Janeiro in Brazil was the Portuguese capital between 1808 and 1821. In 1820, constitutionalist insurrections took place at Oporto and Lisbon. Lisbon regained its status as the capital of Portugal when Brazil declared its independence from Portugal in 1822. The death of King John VI in 1826 led to a crisis of royal succession. His eldest son, Pedro I of Brazil, briefly became Pedro IV of Portugal, but neither the Portuguese nor the Brazilians wanted a unified monarchy, consequently, Pedro abdicated the Portuguese crown in favor of his seven-year-old daughter, Maria de Gloria, on the condition that when she came of age she would marry his brother, Miguel. Dissatisfaction at Pedro's constitutional reforms led the absolutist faction of landowners and the church to proclaim Miguel King in February 1828. This led to the liberal wars in which Pedro eventually forced Miguel to abdicate and go into exile in 1834 and place his daughter on throne American Samoa Queen Maria II. The 1890 British ultimatum was delivered to Portugal on January 11 of that year, an attempt to force the retreat of Portuguese military forces in the land between the Portuguese colonies of Mozambique and Angola. The area had been claimed by Portugal, which included it in its pink map, but this clashed with British aspirations to create a railroad link between Cairo and Cape Town thereby linking its colonies from the north of Africa to the very south. This diplomatic clash led to several waves of protest and prompted the downfall of the Portuguese government. The 1890 British ultimatum was considered by Portuguese historians and politicians at that time to be the most outrageous and infamous action of the British against her oldest ally. After 1815, the Portuguese expanded their trading ports along the African coast, moving inland to take control of Angola and Mozambique. The slave trade was abolished in 1836, in part because many foreign slave ships were flying the Portuguese flag. In Portuguese India, trade flourished in the colony of Goa with its subsidiary colonies of Macau, near Hong Kong on the China coast, and Timor, north of Australia. The Portuguese successfully introduced Catholicism and the Portuguese language into their colonies, while most settlers continued to head to Brazil. 
the First Republic has, over the course of the recent past, been neglected by many historians in favor of the Estado Novo. As a result, it is difficult to attempt a global synthesis of the Republican period in view of the important gaps that still persist in our knowledge of its political history. As far as the October 5, 1910 revolution is concerned, a number of valuable studies have been made, first among which ranks Vasco Pulido Valente's polemical thesis. This historian posited the Jacobin and urban nature of the revolution carried out by the Portuguese Republican Party and claimed that the PRP had turned the Republican regime into a de facto dictatorship. This vision clashes with an older interpretation of the First Republic as a progressive and increasingly democratic regime that presented a clear contrast to Antonio de Oliveira Salazar's ensuing dictatorship. The First Republic was intensely anti-clerical. It was secularist and followed the liberal tradition of disestablishing the powerful role that the Catholic Church once held. Historian Stanley Payne points out, the majority of Republicans took the position that Catholicism was the number one enemy of individualistic middle-class radicalism and must be completely broken as a source of influence in Portugal. Under the leadership of Afonso Costa, the Justice Minister, the revolution immediately targeted the Catholic Church, churches were plundered, convents were attacked and clergy were harassed. Scarcely had the provisional government been installed when it began devoting its entire attention to an anti-religious policy, in spite of the disastrous economic situation. On October 10, five days after the inauguration of the Republic the new government decreed that all convents, monasteries and religious orders were to be suppressed. All residents of religious institutions were expelled and their goods confiscated. The Jesuits were forced to forfeit their Portuguese citizenship. A series of anti-Catholic laws and decrees followed each other in rapid succession. On November 3, a law legalizing divorce was passed and then there were laws to recognize the legitimacy of children born outside wedlock, authorize cremation, secularize cemeteries suppress religious teaching in the schools and prohibit the wearing of the cassock. In addition, the ringing of church bells to signal times of worship was subjected to certain restraints, and the public celebration of religious feasts was suppressed. The government also interfered in the running of seminaries, reserving the right to appoint professors and determine curricula. This whole series of laws authored by Afonso Costa culminated in the law of separation of church and state, which was passed on April 20, 1911. A Republican constitution was approved in 1911, inaugurating a parliamentary regime with reduced presidential powers and two chambers of parliament. The Republic provoked important fractures within Portuguese society notably among the essentially monarchist rural population, in the trade unions, and in the church. Even the PRP had to endure the secession of its more moderate elements, who formed conservative Republican parties like the Evolutionist Party and the Republican Union. In spite of these splits, the PRP, led by Afonso Costa, preserved its dominance largely due to a brand of clientelist politics inherited from the monarchy. In view of these tactics, a number of opposition forces were forced to resort to violence in order to enjoy the fruits of power. There are few recent studies of this period of the Republic's existence, known as the Old Republic. Nevertheless, an essay by Vasco Pulido Valenti should be consulted as should the attempt to establish the political, social, and economic context made by M. Villaverde Cabral. The PRP viewed the outbreak of the First World War as a unique opportunity to achieve a number of goals, 
putting an end to the twin threats of a Spanish invasion of Portugal and of foreign occupation of the African colonies and, at the internal level, creating a national consensus around the regime and even around the party. These domestic objectives were not met, since participation in the conflict was not the subject of a national consensus and since it did not therefore serve to mobilize the population. Quite the opposite occurred, existing lines of political and ideological fracture were deepened by Portugal's intervention in the First World War. The lack of consensus around Portugal's intervention in turn made possible the appearance of two dictatorships, led by General Pimenta de Castro and Sidonio Pais. Sidonismo, also known as Dezembrismo, aroused a strong interest among historians, largely as a result of the elements of modernity that it contained. Antonio José Tello has made clear the way in which this regime predated some of the political solutions invented by the totalitarian and fascist dictatorships of the 1920s and 1930s. Sidonio Pais undertook the rescue of traditional values, notably the Patria, and attempted to rule in a charismatic fashion. A move was made to abolish traditional political parties and to alter the existing mode of national representation in Parliament through the creation of a corporative Senate, the founding of a single party, and the attribution of a mobilizing function to the leader. The state carved out an economically interventionist role for itself while, at the same time, repressing working class movements and leftist republicans. Sidonio Pais also attempted to restore public order and to overcome some of the rifts of the recent past, making the Republic more acceptable to monarchists and Catholics. The vacuum of power created by Sidonio Pais's murder on December 14, 1918 led the country to a brief civil war. The monarchy's restoration was proclaimed in the north of Portugal on January 19, 1919, and four days later a monarchist insurrection broke out in Lisbon. A Republican coalition government, led by José Relvas, coordinated the struggle against the monarchists by loyal army units and armed civilians. After a series of clashes the monarchists were definitively chased from Oporto on February 13, 1919. This military victory allowed the PRP to return to government and to emerge triumphant from the elections held later that year, having won the usual absolute majority. It was during this restoration of the old republic that an attempted reform was carried out in order to provide the regime with greater stability. In August 1919 a conservative president was elected Antonio José de Almeida and his office was given the power to dissolve parliament. Relations with the Holy See, restored by Sidonio Pais, were preserved. The president used his new power to resolve a crisis of government in May 1921, naming a liberal government to prepare the forthcoming elections. These were held on July 10, 1921, with victory going, as was usually the case, to the party in power. However, liberal government did not last long. On October 19 a military pronunciamento was carried out during which and apparently against the wishes of the coup's leaders a number of prominent conservative figures, including Prime Minister Antonio Granjo, were assassinated. This event, known as the Night of Blood left a deep wound among political elites and public opinion. There could be no greater demonstration of the essential fragility of the Republic's institutions and proof that the regime was democratic in name only, since it did not even admit the possibility of the rotation in power characteristic of the elitist regimes of the 19th century. A new round of elections on January 29, 1922 inaugurated a fresh period of stability the PRP once again emerged from the contest with an absolute majority. 
discontent with this situation had not, however, disappeared. Numerous accusations of corruption, and the manifest failure to resolve pressing social concerns wore down the more visible PRP leaders while making the opposition's attacks more deadly. At the same time, moreover, all political parties suffered from growing internal factionalism, especially the PRP itself. The party system was fractured and discredited. This is clearly shown by the fact that regular PRP victories at the ballot box did not lead to stable government. Between 1910 and 1926, there were 45 governments. The opposition of presidents to single-party governments, internal dissent within the PRP, the party's almost non-existent internal discipline, and its desire to group together and lead all Republican forces made any government's task practically impossible. Many different formulas were attempted, including single-party governments, coalitions and presidential executives, but none succeeded. Force was clearly the sole means open to the opposition if the PRP wanted to enjoy the fruits of power. Historians have emphasized the failure and collapse of the Republican dream by the 1920s. Sardica summarizes the consensus of historians. Sardica, however, also points out the permanent impact of the Republican experiment. By the mid-1920s the domestic and international scenes began to favor another authoritarian solution wherein a strengthened executive might restore political and social order. Since the opposition's constitutional route to power was blocked by the various means deployed by the PRP to protect itself, it turned to the army for support. The political awareness of the armed forces had grown during the war, and many of their leaders had not forgiven the PRP for sending them to a war they did not want to fight. They seemed to represent, to conservative forces, the last bastion of order against the chaos that was taking over the country. Links were established between conservative figures and military officers, who added their own political and corporative demands to the already complex equation. The May 28, 1926 coup d'état enjoyed the support of most army units and even of most political parties. As had been the case in December 1917, the population of Lisbon did not rise to defend the republic, leaving it at the mercy of the army. There are few global and up-to-date studies of this turbulent third phase of the republic's existence. Nevertheless. Much has been written about the crisis and fall of the regime and the May 28 movement. The First Republic continues to be the subject of an intense debate. A historiographical balance sheet by Armando Malhiro da Silva identifies three main interpretations. For some historians the First Republic was a progressive and increasingly democratic regime. For others it was essentially a prolongation of the liberal and elitist regimes of the 19th century. A third group chooses to highlight the regime's revolutionary, Jacobin, and dictatorial nature. Political chaos, several strikes, harsh relations with the church, and considerable economic problems aggravated by a disastrous military intervention in the First World War led to the military May 28, 1926 coup d'état. This coup installed the Second Republic, which started as the Ditadura Nacional and became the Estado Novo in 1933, led by economist Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. He transformed Portugal into a sort of fascist regime that evolved into a single-party corporative regime. Portugal, although neutral, informally aided the nationalists in the Spanish Civil War. Salazar's policy after the war was to provide a certain level of liberalization in politics, in terms of organized opposition with more freedom of the press. 
Opposition parties were tolerated to an extent, but they were also controlled, limited, and manipulated, with the result that they split into factions and never formed a united opposition. Portugal was officially neutral in World War II, but in practice Salazar collaborated with the British and sold them rubber and tungsten. In late 1943, he allowed the Allies to establish air bases in the Azores to fight German U-boats. Moreover, Salazar helped Spain avoid German control. However, as tungsten was a major product of Portugal, it was also sold to Germany until June 1944, when the threat of a German attack on Portugal was minimal. Salazar worked to regain control of East Timor after the Japanese had seized it. Also, he admitted several thousand Jewish refugees during the war. Lisbon, maintaining air connections with Britain and the U.S., became a hotbed of spies of several war parties and served as the base for the International Red Cross in its distribution of relief supplies to POWs. In 1961, the Portuguese army was involved in armed action in its colony in Goa against an Indian invasion. The operations resulted in a humiliating Portuguese defeat and the loss of the colonies in India. Independence movements also became active in Portuguese Angola, Portuguese Mozambique, and Portuguese Guinea. The Portuguese colonial war started. Portugal, during this period, was never an outcast, and was a founding member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the European Free Trade Association. After the death of Salazar in 1970, his replacement by Marcelo Catano offered a certain hope that the regime would open up, the Primavera Marquilista. However the colonial wars in Africa continued, political prisoners remained incarcerated, freedom of association was not restored, censorship was only slightly eased and the elections remained tightly controlled. The regime retained its characteristic traits, censorship, corporativeness, with the market economy dominated by a handful of economical groups, continuous surveillance and intimidation of several sectors of society through the use of a political police and techniques instilling fear. The Carnation Revolution of 1974, an effectively bloodless left-wing military coup, installed the Third Republic. Broad democratic reforms were implemented. In 1975, Portugal granted independence to its overseas provinces in Africa. Nearly one million Portuguese or persons of Portuguese descent left these former colonies as refugees. In that same year, Indonesia invaded and annexed the Portuguese province of Portuguese Timor in Asia before independence could be granted. The massive exodus of the Portuguese military and citizens from Angola and Mozambique, would prompt an era of chaos and severe destruction in those territories after independence from Portugal in 1975. From May 1974 to the end of the 1970s, over a million Portuguese citizens from Portugal's African territories left those territories as destitute refugees the Retornados. The newly independent countries were ravaged by brutal civil wars in the following decades the Angolan Civil War and Mozambican Civil War responsible for millions of deaths and refugees. The Asian dependency of Macau, after an agreement in 1986, was returned to Chinese sovereignty in 1999. Portugal applied international pressure to secure East Timor's independence from Indonesia as East Timor was still legally a Portuguese dependency, and recognized as such by the United Nations. After a referendum in 1999, East Timor voted for independence, which Portugal recognized in 2002.
with the 1975-76 independence of its colonies, the 560-year-old Portuguese Empire effectively ended. Simultaneously, 15 years of war effort also came to an end, many Portuguese returned from the colonies and came to comprise a sizable proportion of the population, approximately 580,000 of Portugal's 9.8 million citizens in 1981. This opened new paths for the country's future just as others closed. In 1986, Portugal entered the European Economic Community and left the European Free Trade Association which had been founded by Portugal and its partners in 1960. The country joined the Euro in 1999. The Portuguese Empire ended de facto in 1999 when Macau was returned to China, and a jure in 2002 when East Timor became independent. From 1974 through 2014, Portugal experienced 25 governments. The Portuguese economy once again declined, exacerbated by external debt, as well as financial and budgetary problems. Portugal has since resorted to three economic programs seeking international financial aid from the IMF. In 1977-78, Portugal requested assistance to mitigate deficits and sharp increases in unemployment. In 1983, Portugal again requested IMF support to cope with a recession, high interest rates abroad, trade imbalances, and high deficits. In 2009, Portugal's budget deficit hit a record 9.3% of GDP. In 2011, the Portuguese economy collapsed sparking a sharp rise in borrowing costs, forcing Lisbon to seek a bailout. Portugal then agreed a three-year, 78-billion euro bailout with the European Union and IMF. In 2013, Portugal recorded all-time high debt levels, 129% of the country's GDP.